Good afternoon. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Major Lindsay in Africa webinar focusing on the recent re recently released 2021 Law Department Benchmarking Report that was done in partnership with the Association of Corporate Counsel. My name is Heather Nielsen, and I'll be your technical moderator today behind the scenes. I'll be in the background answering any questions that you might have. If you experience any difficulty at any time during the webinar, please submit your questions to me in the Q&A panel, and I'll assist you. Before I hand this over to my colleague, Greg Richter, I'd like to run through some housekeeping items. You should all be able to see the screen right now and hopefully hear my voice. All attendees are in listen-only mode for the duration of the presentation, and as a reminder, this call is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website in the next few days. Today's webinar will be approximately one hour with 45 to 50 minutes of content followed by 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Speaking of Q&A, you may ask us a question at any time throughout the event and we encourage you to do so. At the top right of the screen is the GoToWebinar panel. Just open up the console, type a question, and hit submit. Your questions are anonymous and your name will not be shared with the rest of the audience. We will try our best to respond to them at the end of the presentation during Q&A. However, if we don't have time to, follow, to respond to all of them, we will follow up with some inquiries later. Also, in the handout section of the console, we've added the executive summary for the 2021 Law Department Benchmarking Report. Please feel free to download it now or during the call. We will also send a link to it in our follow-up email. At the close of the webinar, a short survey will pop up on your screen. We hope that you'll complete it. It's short, about eight questions in total, and shouldn't take more than two to three minutes. With that said, and without further ado, let me turn this over to my colleague, Greg Richter, partner and VP at Major Lindsay in Africa, who will set the stage for today's webinar and introduce our wonderful panelists. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Heather. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here today. And I want to thank the ACC for their partnership on this important survey and report. Uh, and uh, just a, a quick mention, I'm Greg Richter with Major Lindsay and Africa. I lead our in-house counsel recruiting practice and advisory services practice, and I'm excited to be here today with our three panelists. Our first panelist I want to introduce is Sam Runganadon, uh, Senior Director of Legal Operations at AbbVie, one of the fifth largest biopharmaceutical companies in the world. He is a two-time ACC Value Champion, a member of the ACC Legal Operations Executive Committee and former chair. Brian Kepke is the VP and General Counsel and Secretary for Suburban Protein, which is a publicly traded master limited partnership that specializes in the distribution of propane, heating oil, and refined fuels, as well as a marketer of natural gas and electricity throughout the United States. Brian uh, or prior to joining Suburban Propane, Brian held in-house counsel positions with Caterpillar, Avis Budget Group, and also served as a senior attorney and advisor at the Securities and Exchange Commission. He is a one-time ACC value champion, former chair of the ACC Litigation Network, and soon to be president of the ACC's New Jersey chapter. Congratulations, Brian. And Trevor Four. CEO of Smarter Law Solutions, former general counsel and global leader of legal services at EY. I want to thank our esteemed panel for being here today to join us in this discussion. And uh, next slide, please, Heather. Uh, today, we're going to go over uh, a bunch of content from uh, the report. Uh, there's too much content to get into during just one hour. I really encourage you to take, you know, take your own time to read the report and analyze your circumstance and context. As a reminder, the report can be downloaded right here. Uh, today, we'll talk through uh, a variety of areas. These are the, the six areas that are covered in the report, legal department structure, staffing, spending, work allocation, use of law firms, and diversity. In the back of the report, you can find demographics and methodology. If you have questions uh, specific to the report um, and or methodology, demographics, you can contact the ACC at research at acc.com. And uh, for custom benchmarking requests, you can also visit acc.com slash smarter law or contact MLA or ACC directly and we'll, we'll be happy to assist you. Uh, the, the survey was opened in March and closed in May of this year. It represents roughly 500 law departments spanning 24 industries in 30 countries. Uh, it is the largest data set, we believe, of its kind, and uh, 
we look forward to diving in a little deeper with you today. Next slide, please. Today we're going to cover the context and purpose of benchmarking, how to use benchmarking, and headline findings from the report. We also expect and hope to get some time toward the end for Q&A. As mentioned, uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A uh, button there on the screen. Next slide, please. Um, so the context and purpose of benchmarking. Um, first, let me say, I, I think for all the general counsel searches we've done in the last few years, I've heard CEOs say firsthand, I want a lawyer who's a business person or a business person that happens to be a lawyer. Um, and I think what they mean in that regard is not just someone who's close to the business, a business enabler uh, and a risk manager, but also someone who's an expert in the business of law. And CEOs are really looking for that type of partner today uh, more than ever. I think the days of telling your CEO to walk back down the hall, your CFO to walk back down the hall when they question budget metrics relative to the legal department are long gone or hanging up on the Zoom call for that matter. Um, some of you on this call may be of a different vintage and, and don't remember those days. Um, analytics drives good decision making. And uh, today more than ever, we need to make sure as, as a legal function, uh, we measure success. And as Peter Drucker said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So legal, legal leaders should ask, how can we show value to the business and speak the business language? What are the key performance indicators that apply to legal? How can we deliver more for less? Efficiency improvements, where do I start? We believe benchmarking provides the answers, the objective measurement of legal department performance. We all know that uh, businesses measure performance metrics. These are a few examples we're all familiar with, earnings per share. You can see the list here. Uh, the best legal functions utilize our own performance metrics to speak the language and avoid being judged or managed purely on subjective factors and opinions, however favorable. Next slide, please. The ACC MLA's legal department management benchmarking is the biggest independent third-party database that, com get, that competitively compares your legal function to peer companies by industry and size according to a variety of factors. As I mentioned, there is custom benchmarking available through the ACC and MLA, as well as Smarter Law. Benchmarking differs from opinion surveys, the what, the what keeps you up at night surveys, because it provides real-time data dashboard to understand and drive your specific function rather than just discuss general issues of interest. How to use benchmarking. Gather your own internal data needed to calculate a given benchmarking. So for example, the lawyer's per billion metric. Compare yours to industries and size in the database. Con connect your comparative positioning with the consequences of that position. If you're positioned in the lower quartile for resources inputs, does that lead to negative consequences elsewhere in terms of work outputs? Make or justify improved decisions. Make or justify improvement decisions, if any. Um, at the end of the day, for us, you need to know where you are. You need to know where you stack up to know where you're going. And uh, I think a challenge we find working with lots of law departments is, is do they have their hands on this data? I think the first step is knowing where your data is, knowing you can report that data, and then begin to provide a comparative benchmark. Next slide, please. It's obvious to us, assuming we, com we compete effectively with our peers, if our legal metrics compare more favorably, our law department compares more favorably. Now I want to jump in and ask Trevor to speak a little bit to bring an example to life about a real benchmarking scenario. Trevor Four. Hey, Greg. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this is a, a real life example of what Greg was just explaining where uh, a, a, a major company um, is taking just two benchmarks. An important point that Greg is making um, in the previous slides is that there's a comparison with peers and there's a connection with other factors. Because one data point on its own means very little unless it's connected to other things as we shall see. So in this case, if you look at the comparison, um, the very first uh, box at the top there, Heather, 
um, the external spend as a percentage of company revenue. In this case, the company having divided its spend by its revenue found that it was spending four times the mean of its peer companies in its industry sector. So that seems pretty bad and why? When you look at its internal staffing, which is the next highlight, its internal staffing was a third of its peers. It's what we classically call the false economy syndrome. And many of you be familiar with this, where a company somehow thinks it's saving money by skimping on internal headcount, as we see here a third, and ends up spending net a great deal more, because in this case, the comparison was four times the external spend of the very same peer companies. So you see that there's a comparison and a connection, and the connection is a very, very, very powerful thing to make. One data point on its own tends to mean very little. I mean, how many calories do you consume? Doesn't mean much unless you compare it with how many calories you burn and what you weigh at the end of the month. And at the bottom here, you'll see the connection we're talking about. Benchmarking focuses on the bottom of this triangle, headcount and cost. So the number of heads, how much they cost internally, externally, and the additional cost of say liabilities. But those are the resource inputs. Inputs are only measurable in terms of value in relation to its outputs. How much you're getting for your money, for the headcount, for the, the your bang per buck. And that's at the top of the triangle that you'll recognize anyway. The amount of work you've got to cover, getting the work done, levels of compliance, and how you're doing it, the degree of client satisfaction. So the, that relationship you'll recognize. More for less, for example. More coverage, more compliance, more client satisfaction, ever demanding, but with fewer headcount or the same headcount and certainly reduce net cost. But also if you look left to right on that triangle, there's also a dynamic that you measure, you manage, and you can see on this chart, make versus buy. Do you make your legal services using headcount or do you buy it using external net cost? So the important thing is to make your own calculation and then compare with your peers and then connect it with the consequences of your resource inputs, namely the outputs. Over to you, Greg. Thank you, Trevor. Very insightful. Uh, before we get into the, the to the panel, uh, we want to talk through just a few headlines. As I said, this is a dense and deep report. You need to read it in your own time and evaluate and analyze your situation and circumstance. Um, these are some of the headlines we've we've pulled out that we think are are worth noting. Uh, just 29% of companies track internal diversity, and, and of those that do, 47% have a formal strategy to improve in this area. Desp despite the growing popularity of ALSPs, just 12% of companies increased their usage of these providers in 2020. There's a degree of trending that shows legal departments with greater legal operations staff tend to spend less on legal fees as a percentage of company revenue and use a lower number of law firms overall early signs of a positive impact of the dedicated legal function management. In 80% of law departments, CLOs report directly to the organization's CEO, and 92%, uh, over 10 billion in revenue, CLOs report directly to the CEO. And when mid-size and large companies use fewer law firms, they reduce their external legal spend as a percentage of company revenue. I will say there's a lot of interesting information in the report. Take, for example, functional reporting uh, in the law, the law department or, or CLO. Um, there's a lot of data there. Um, I think as an organization, we've seen the remit of the general counsel really increase over the years, especially throughout COVID. Um, it feels like this has been a time where the general counsel has been in the spotlight as well as the legal function along with the CHRO. If you look at the last recession, I think that was the time for the CFO to shine. This feels like the time for the general counsel to shine. And uh, I think the question when I think about the functional reporting is, is this strategic or is legal a junk drawer? And I think that's something that we'll have to look at in future years. It's the first time we've, we've reported on that in our survey. So more to come, stay tuned. Uh, next slide, please, please, Heather. We're gonna dive into diversity first. Let's keep moving. Uh, just 29% of companies surveyed track internal diversity metrics. As you can see, larger companies track this at a higher rate, which is, I think, not surprising. 
Next slide, please. Again, from our point of view, we hear this in every conversation we have with clients about hiring. It is an important, if not the most important, and that was validated in the report. You can see the other areas here mentioned. It's a pretty good split between formal law departments having formal strategies to improve departmental diversity with tangible consequences. Next slide, please. Legal, de legal department has diversity metrics with respect to its outside counsel. Um, this one surprised us a little bit. 82% uh, report no. Not surprisingly, a much higher share in large companies over 10 billion report having. Uh, diversity metrics with respect to outside counsel. Next slide, please. Uh, I thought this slide was interesting because it shows, I think, a variety of ways you can manage outside counsel and, and the factors that you could look at when creating a program relative to diversity. As we know, diversity is an important aspect of company strategy. Uh, I think it's more important than ever, and you have to have a plan. Like we said earlier, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. 75% uh, of companies report that they do not have uh, formal requirements for outside counsel with tangible consequences. Um, what I would like to do here, if we can just stay on that slide for a moment, um, is bring Sam into the discussion. Abby was recently recognized as the ACC's 2021 Value Through Diversity Champion. Congratulations to Abby and, and Sam. We're very fortunate to have Sam with us to share his perspective on this most important topic. Sam was a key player in the ACC's recognition of Abbey in this regard. Sam, can you give us a sense of what you've done at Abbey um, to improve and make diversity the key foundational platform for your organization? Um, good morning, good afternoon, folks. Thanks, Greg. Um, it's it's interesting because you you brought this slide up and and uh, our initial focus was on our uh, partner law firms, uh, but stepping back when you look at Abbey as a whole, uh, we consider diversity as a strategic pillar for us. Um, it's we believe that it makes us more innovative. We actually incorporate diverse perspectives and it helps us serve a uh, our, our client population. So that, that's the background in which we function. So from a company perspective, this is a very important uh, aspect of our organization. Additionally, when you look at our CLO, she uh, resolved that we were gonna use our influence to enhance outside counsel of diversity uh, in the legal industry. So th that's, that's, the, that's the initial push for us in terms of why we got to where we are today. So in 2017, when we first started, I wish we had this report at that time. I don't think diversity was measured at that time. Um, we had to do our own benchmark. We actually actually went out and reached out to uh, folks across the industry to see what were the things that uh, they were looking for? How did we compare to others? And then there's a report from NALP, NALP, um, that talks about law firm diversity. And so it, it does a uh, time base. So you, I think there's about 20 years of data in there. Um, using the benchmarking data that we gathered along with the uh, NALP data and our own internal data, what we were able to triangulate um, was the fact that we do have a reasonable growth of um, women and minority associate at the associate level but we didn't see the same when we got to the partner level. So we chose to focus on the, on the partner level and the growth in the partner level for our matters. So we started to measure the law firms um, on their uh, engagement uh, from a partner perspective in our matters, the hours spent on our matters. And as a result, we expected them um, to, to uh, have a broader impact in their organizations, pull through more people into the leadership position. Uh, we then worked with each of the law firms and set specific targets with them for both women and minority. Uh, 
I'm I'm happy to say that these these were five year targets, so we expected them to uh, approach this on a yearly basis in a systematic way, and build their um, leadership at a partner level. And I have to say, in year two of this program, we've already seen the law firms meet our uh, the targets we've worked with them on, and so we're very happy with where we're headed. And we have a yearly conversation with, with each of our law firms. Um, and and, and the, right now, the focus is on the top 80% of our spend. And as a result, what we've done is we've enabled uh, and we've seen the results where we've seen partner promotions. We've seen people who are on our matters, uh, both from a women and, and uh, minority perspective. Thank you, Sam. Um, as Sam mentioned, this is the first year that we've reported uh, diversity metrics within the report. And uh, looking forward to future years as we track our progress here as an industry and a profession. Um, such an important area, and I'm really pleased that we're partnered with the ACC to look at this data. And thanks again, Sam, for your point of view and perspective here. We're gonna move on to staffing. And uh, next slide, please. Um, this provides a good look at the ratios per lawyer. As you can see, uh, three to one in terms of lawyers per paralegal, seven to one in terms of lawyers per legal operation professional, and five to one lawyers per admin. And you'll see below just the overall composition based on the mean of the law department in terms of staffing. I want to bring Brian into the conversation here and ask Brian, what is your experience regarding um, staffing metrics relative to your department? And how can leaders use this to interpret their situation, Brian? Thanks, Greg. And um, you know, thanks for having me. You know, I guess I would first respond to your, your question by, you know, actually citing your earlier statement about analytics driving good decision making. Uh, because I think it really becomes, when you look at benchmark data such as staffing um, and, and how you compare with your peers and your benchmarks, I mean, it, it becomes an enabler in that discussion and, um, and, and certainly helps you build that business case. And, and in my experience, um, e even when I started my, my in-house career at Caterpillar, um, we were using benchmarks to make sure that our legal department and the support that we were providing the business kept pace with the growth of revenue and the growth of the business. And so that four to one ratio really was was always key and in, in, in really the way I've been brought up in house in terms of making sure that, you know, that we're continuing to grow the legal function um, to stay in with in pace with the business. And you know, as I moved along in my career, when I joined Avis Budget Group, we um, we engaged in a legal transformation project. And as part of that project, um, we wanted to look at the staffing that we we had as a department because we 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 felt and knew that we really weren't staffed large enough, and we had been making business cases uh, to try and increase staffing, but we really weren't very successful. Um, uh, for for various reasons, until we were able to really hunker down and put together a really solid business case which was was well rooted with the benchmarks and showing that you know we not only did we, we did we feel like we were understaffed and and we had feedback from, from some of our our business uh, partners to say we didn't have enough staffing to provide the support they needed but just as we were looking outside at the benchmarks you know it was it was shown by the data you know we were we were at more of the 3 to 1 uh, category as opposed to the 4 to 1 and sometimes having that extra attorney just makes all the world's a difference. And um, so while not every, you know, every company can be compared with and, and sets the mold for the whole industry, you know, and there's a utility to using these benchmarks to be able to make your business case, I think, um, I think they're vitally important. Um, you know, as I said, it's an enabler in that discussion if you know how to use the data. Uh, so in my, in my experience, it's, it's been a great facilitator for the business. Uh, been a great facilitator for the leaders of the legal function as they're trying to make sure that the um, the legal department is keeping pace with the needs of, of its clients. Thank you, Brian. Excellent. Great perspective. Can we move to the next slide, please? 
This is a, it's a fascinating slide. As we all know, the legal operations profession has really grown up before our eyes over the last decade or, or, or so. And I want to bring Sam into to this part and just ask, what story does this tell relative to legal operations and scaling of a legal function? Yeah, Greg, when you look at this, I think uh, going back to what Brian said, this is great justification for someone with a seven people organization to go up and say, hey, I need a legal ops person. Look at what others are doing. And I think it's a recognition by CLOs and general counsels of the need for someone dedicated to manage the business of law, right? Um, and then you, when you look at the chart and the scaling of the chart as you see larger organizations, it's the recognition of the complexity of the world we live in, right? Each legal function, think of it. There is a maybe a group of 100 lawyers managing maybe 150 firms on the outside and serving the needs of um, 25, 30,000 employees. So you're talking about a very complex environment in which we want them to practice at the top of their license. In order to do that, you need to bring in a legal ops person who can help you standardize your processes, work with technologies, uh, bring in the right technologies, uh, manage your outside counsel efficiently, and uh, disaggregate the work so you can actually uh, write resource at, at the right level. And so this chart tells me that the, that work is well underway in most companies. And you see the advent of a uh, legal ops person as early as seven people in an organization here. That's very impressive that uh, the, the uh, GCs and CLOs are thinking this way. Yeah, I agree. And it's the kind of the first time I've seen the data presented this way, where you can kind of see the, the growth of a legal function and, and when that, that legal ops professional should be added. Um, I think it's a, a fascinating data point. Trevor, anything to add from your point of view here? Yeah, um, Sam's being a bit modest. It, it, the, the fact that um, companies of bigger size use uh, legal operations is kind of interesting. It's happenstance. The most powerful points of his role is made out in the data, as you said, in the headlines. That Forget about my opinion, Brian's opinion, your opinion. Statistically, in this data set, it shows that companies that employ a, a larger proportion of operation staff spend a lower proportion of fees externally of revenue. So these are, these are very light trends, very light correlation, but it makes the case numerically, rather than via anecdotes, that legal operations people can pay for themselves if you get the right people doing the right thing as Sam does. Thank you, Trevor. I agree. Next slide, please. All right, we're gonna move into spending. Um, obviously a really important area for metrics. This is a pretty noisy slide. I think most of you were told in law school there would be no math on this exam, but as we all know, uh, it's important that you drive down to the details. And uh, I find this slide to be fascinating. Um, and obviously it means a lot more when you dive into different uh, company sizes, industries, and really trying to get comparative custom cuts of data. Um, but I, I, I look at this and, and you could see that, you know, companies enjoy some economies of scale um, as they grow. And I want to get your perspective here, Brian. Um, what experience do you have regarding inside and outside spend uh, relative to smaller versus larger companies? And what factors influence the legal functions, philosophy, and operating model? Thanks, Greg. You know, uh, in my career, in my experience, um, I, I've found that, you know, first of all, if you're if you're managing the legal function correctly, as 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 we really kind of started this whole conversation off, thinking about the business, um, you know, you really have to start to get savvy and efficient with respect to how you're spending your dollars, because, um, you know, as as our colleague Trevor would 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 tell us, I mean, more and more nowadays, general counsels are being pressed. To, to do more with less. And in fact, that's, that's the mandate as, you know, as the CEOs are coming across and we, we face days like now when you hit a recession or you hit you know, difficult times where the business has to, has to tighten the belt. Legal function is one of those areas, unfortunately, that doesn't generate a lot of revenue at times. 
and is 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 very quickly you know thrown out there as a potential opportunity to try and find some savings. So how how legal departments manage their dollars at times is very closely scrutinized. And um, you know, in my career, I've always I've always found that leadership is really savvy in terms of trying to create opportunities to um, again, as we're managing staffing of our department and keeping pace with the business, um, to find opportunities to bring in in in-house expertise to help reduce the outside dependency uh, from from law firms or from the legal process outsourcing that that occurs. And um, you know, so, you know, when I was at Caterpillar, I, I started off, I was, I think I was like 85th or 86th attorney on staff. And, um, you know, eight, nine years later, when I left, they had about 250 attorneys because the business had grown so immensely. Um, you know, and it was all done as a function of trying to keep and build that in-house expertise. When I moved to Avis Budget Group, again, we we knew we were understaffed and we we had a great we actually brought trevor in and his team and and did a great study to look at where our spend was and where are our key risks and use that as a facilitator to try and reduce outside spend we had an outside spend at the time which was over 50 million dollars and as a result of um you know looking at ways to create efficiencies and reduce costs we were able to trim a significant amount amount of that outside spend by insourcing and bringing in legal expertise, so I do think it's a I do think it's a function that really while you you're, it's true that larger companies do enjoy a larger opportunity there to to dive in and create savings, I think it's something that it's a pro, it's a value prospect that appeals to every company regardless of whether you're a small, medium, or large sized company, um, and I think it you know it's it's what what drives that you know I think. There's a there's a couple factors. Obviously, the structure of your department and where you're where you're looking to go. Um, I do think it's uh, really impeded, or it's it's important that you have the sophistication of leadership, um, and 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 having a philosophy where you you want to break that mold, and, and sort of you, you have to have an openness to doing things different. You know, use of technology and efficiencies is another area where you know companies are finding more and more opportunities to reduce that outside spend. Um, or, or maybe even increase outside spend depending on the needs of the business, but always in, in, with the mind of, of trying to keep pace with what the needs of the business are. Um, ultimately, you know, to try and reduce savings or, or reduce, reduce spend and increase savings. You also have, I think another key importance is the use of outside legal counsel who's on the same page with you. And, um, and having somebody who is as I'll, I'll talk about later on in this presentation, more of a Jetson and not not really a Flintstone in terms of how they've evolved in their in their support of the business, and uh, in a rate structure that would allow for that as well. So, uh, you know, I think it's 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 it really doesn't matter the size of the business. I think uh, as as legal um, leaders are are being challenged to do more with less. I think it, it just creates more opportunities for us to look inward. Uh, to try and figure out how we can how we can increase efficiencies and, and increase savings through that end sourcing and, and, and reduction of outside spend. Thank you, Brian. Excellent perspective. Um, Sam, any any different point of view or anything to add relative to legal ops? How would you use this slide if you were looking at it for the first time in terms of uh, improving efficiency? Yeah, I think. Uh, the, the way I look at it is what Brian's talking about is the result. What we need to do is start here. When you look at this data, for example, the first thing that my eyes went to was when you look at the total spend as a percentage of revenue, that's that's a key factor, right? The, the median tells you that it's, it's, for example, for a large company, it's 0.227%. So I do, I do remember in my, in a prior role in another company, the first thing I had to do was measure our uh, legal spend as a percentage of revenue and justify why our number was larger than what the median was. Well, the CFO said, I want to be in the first quartile. And we were in the third quartile. So we had a conversation with the CFO about it where we showed that if you took the extraordinary spend that was related to litigation. We were very similar to many of the companies that were within the first two quartiles. 
So you could have a conversation with your team internally first to understand why do you why 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 are your numbers the way they are relative to the benchmarks? Um, and, and in some cases, you need to be above the benchmarks. Uh, so where what what is your target? And then to look at the mix of inside and outside spend. The the next numbers that I look at are what's this mix? I think Trevor gave us an example where it was out of whack. So is there a value in looking at the percentage outside spend and, uh, and the percentage of inside spend? And is there a good value in looking at that mix? Um, and the third piece to, I looked at was being a legal ops guy, looking at the legal technology spend. Is, is 2% the right amount of money to spend for you? Uh, what, what are your goals as an organization? Do you wanna take more work off the attorney's plates? Are we trying to automate more work and all those things become factors and so here are the ways you can use that to pitch the programs you want to launch uh, make make better buy versus uh, uh, you know make versus buy decisions and and really drive a lot of the decision making that brian was talking about so it's legal ops is really an internal consultant for the gc in these situations excellent thank you sam Trevor, anything from, from your point of view to add here? Well, I should emphasize what you said earlier, that um, the um, comparison and the connection are both important. Any individual um, data point here doesn't mean anything unless it's compared and then connected to something else. Let me give an example. You ask about what my eyes are drawn to. Well, cost per lawyer hour is interesting. Um, um, we looked, if you look at 120 to $130 per hour for internal lawyer, fine. Doesn't mean anything on its own. If your external cost per hour is, as we found in the case of um, Avis Budget, four times that, then you're seeing obviously a make by inefficiency because you're paying basically four times for the same lawyer, whether you're internal or external. But if you are this if take follow sam's story let's say your cost per hour was 300 dollars internally doesn't mean anything on its own either if the consequence of hiring a bunch of 300 dollars per hour superstars is that your output is double your client satisfaction is double your clients your compliance is double and your external reliance is much less because they're superstars it's a good deal so the important thing as always is the triangulation no individual data point, whether it's you're higher or lower, means anything on its own. It's the comparison and the consequence. Yeah, absolutely. And they're decisions. They're about how you, you want to run your function exactly. and, and there's trade-offs exactly. and, and different ways to look at things. That's, that's excellent, Trevor. Thank you. And actually, right, yeah, the next slide, please. Go ahead, Sam. The one thing I want to add is it's it's also not just I'm gonna add more people to it because you do need to understand the load on your organization and what can you bring in house. And you have to really think that through in order for you to do that, move that line when you make the buy, make versus buy decision. Yeah, so Sam's absolutely, absolutely. right. When you try and triangle earlier on, you saw coverage. That's the 100% load of all the work that needs to be done. The typical coverage for legal departments, if you look at ACC, 200 companies we surveyed, is it, wait for this now, legal departments cover 50% of their own basic essential work, 50%, and are typically understaffed and overspend externally. That's, that's the most common pattern. When you benchmark it, your pattern might be different. So setting what's the 100% goal of coverage, which is always going up, measuring how much that's covered, then gives you an idea of how far your resources are going. One factor means nothing without the other. Yeah, it's all about context. Thank you for that. All right, we're going to move on to the next slide. I think just to point out in the report, there it was too noisy to put the slide like this together, but you can do a deeper dive into technology areas by allocated spend. Um, this is a really comprehensive list. If if you're thinking about investing in technology in the coming years, um, this might be a way to kind of sort of divide and dissect and think through 
uh, the different areas that, that are available. Legal tech has come such a long way in the last decade or two, and, and uh, you know, I think prioritization for your organization really shows up uh, based on your context as we're discussing. Um, Sam, anything that you take away from this slide just generally when you think about benchmarking relative to tech? I know you mentioned this a little bit before, but anything to add there? All, all I can say is this inventory is so helpful. This is a starting point for many of us to look at what technologies are available and what are others looking at. Um, in, in my world, uh, what I would say is, is, is it's not about budgets. It's about what is your profile? Because technology automates what you've routinized, right? Before you can routinize it, you can't put technology in place. So understand your profile, build your processes, and see how your people can be uh, more efficient as a result of it. If you prioritize the work they have to do, again, keeping the attorneys working at the top of their license, you can look at the more routine work to see what can be turned into self-service, what can be turned into automation, what can be brought, what kind of AI tools can you bring in? Where can you use e-signatures? All that then falls out as a result of it. And then here's the list of technology you can pick and choose from to make your case, to make your attorneys more efficient. And that's how I would look at this list and not necessarily about looking at what others do. It's so important to look at your own organization and how you would you know, look at efficiencies for your organization. Thank you, Sam. It's interesting. I was reading a report from over a decade ago, and, and contracts management does top the list here today in terms of uh, the, the sort of biggest area of focus, and it was the same thing over 10 years ago. So it continues to be an area for organizations to get their arms around and invest in. Let's move to the next slide and dive into use of outside counsel, use of law firms. Next slide, please. Uh, list of uh, preferred providers of outside counsel, 77% uh, report, yes, they do have a list. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this breaks down how many uh, law firms were engaged by organizations within the report. Um, I want to call out the, the large company data set. When you think about 158 lawyers and 77% of companies are, are reporting they have a preferred list. I'm wondering if this feels like the right mix. And, and maybe, Sam, from your point of view, um, is that efficient? Is that right? How do, how do you look at it in AbbVie or Big Pharma generally? Yeah, so it, it depends on the profile of the company, obviously. And, and clearly, the larger companies have a need that, uh, and I'll say need from a from one perspective, and let, let me explain that, to have a larger footprint. Um, one example of uh, needing a larger footprint is the fact that you have a global patent portfolio and you have local firms. Um, in some cases, you could have a single firm that's managing a, a list of local firms. And I know Trevor has, has done that before for one of the organizations he's worked with. Um, in our case, we actually have local firms directly bill us and work with us directly so that we have transparency of, of spend across the globe. And so as a result, we have, and this, this number looks very reasonable for us. It's about the right number for us. If you look at the spend concentration, though, it's with the top 25 firms. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. Brian. Um, Obviously, you were a big part of the Avis budget transformation and really pioneering within that organization a law firm convergence exercise. Um, can you talk to us about that journey a little bit and and, and uh, what you learned throughout that process? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, well, I guess, first of all, to just to set the table, um, we had engaged in a legal transformation project that was really focused in on uh, a couple key areas, which staffing, which I talked about earlier, uh, we were also looking at our law firms and, and the efficiencies we might be able to create there. And then we looked at our technology and what we could be doing there to create savings and cost, cost improvements as well. In the area of law firms, um, we actually worked with Mr. Farr and his group again, um, which was a rather massive effort. Um, 
we had at the time, and Avis Budget Group is a, is a global company, operations around the world. And um, you know, we had really no idea at the time how many law firms we were engaging and working with. We thought we did, um, but really wasn't, wasn't fully known until we performed a global audit. And as a result of the audit, we learned that we had just under 700 law firms at the time that we were working with. And uh, at times, the business was engaging law firms to do work that the legal department was oblivious to, had no idea what was going on. Uh, but across the board, what was what was also clear to us is that we had no synergies in terms of pricing, um, no, no levers uh, that we could really pull to try and create additional savings for us, um, and had this massive outflow of, of, of spend to these law firms. So as a result, we, um, we engaged in a convergence program where we um, we sought out and we invited about 130 of our most dear and favorite firms amongst the 700 that we were working with and in, invited them to participate in our RFP process, which I, I use RFP very lightly because I think it was a much different um, process than what you would think of as a typical RFP process. But um, from that 130-ish firms that we invited, we got down to just under about 50 firms uh, that we invited uh, to sort of go on to the next stage and um, and have more more um, discreet and um, intimate conversations about who those firms were and really what we were looking to do. Um, and I would say we had a we had a, a list of universal requirements which got into very uh, strategic areas for the law firms. Uh, we were as part of our evolution as a as a law department, we did increase and add a legal ops function. And we wanted to know which law firms that we were talking to also had done something to improve um, their operations as a law firm. Um, we got into areas of you know, how creative and savvy were they relative to pricing and, and willingness to engage in these types of discussions um, with, their, with their clients. Um, we just had, we kind of went through it, you know, how, in, how innovative were they as firms? How, um, how forward thinking were they? How, how, um, you know, how, give good examples of how they would help their clients look around the, the corner to sort of expect and, and to um, project uh, potential risks that might help the, you know, advise their clients to avoid in the future. So we went through this process and from that, we got down to um, a, a group of about 17 firms that, that we really got into the weeds of, of the next stage of our evolution. And, Ultimately, uh, in the negotiations and discussions, we, we were able to land on a panel of seven firms. So from just under 700 firms globally down to a panel of seven. And, um, you know, that was a great, <laughs> for us, that was, that was really, you know, that, for any firm, I think any company, that's a huge jump. Um, and, and I think, uh, and as Sam had said earlier, no one model fits everybody and everybody's needs are different for us. We, we wanted to try and eliminate the, the you know, having m multiple firms handle work in, in one particular area. And so we established sort of a hub and spoke model where you had one lead firm who would take on the responsibilities of coordinating efforts in a particular practice area to help establish and meet the needs of the, of the business in different parts of the world. But, um, you know, just a great effort. Um, in the end of it, again, it created a great amount of savings for the company. Um, was a lot of work, but I'd say at the end of the day, going from 700 firms to a panel of seven, um, you know, the relationships you build with these firms. And I would have to say through the process, it's also amazing. Um, our panel was not just made up of small regional firms. These are, these are well-known global firms, you know, some of the most sophisticated firms I'd say in the, in the world. Um, but you know, throughout the process, the other side that was was also pretty interesting is is that there are other well-known global firms that are out there, and and they're very much stuck in the you know practice of I do the work and I bill you for the work, and that's that's our relationship. And as we went through our process, we called those firms the Flintstones, and we wanted to settle on a panel of what we call the Jetsons, which are those firms that are innovative, taking the next step, you know, have legal ops functions. Um, and really helping us kind of get to the next level where we were wanting to go. And um, and there are a lot of Flintstones out there that are still major firms or large firms um, that, that you'd be shocked to find that, that you'd throw in that category. But um, great exercise, a lot of work, well worth it at the end of it. 
and um, you know, and happy to have happy to have Trevor comment on that. But um, well, well the, the, the two quick points I will do before we go into questions because against time, Brian, Greg, it's worth making. One is the the, the numbers are in now. Thanks to the ACC and your good self broadening the terms of the survey, we now see that statistically across mid size and large companies, the companies that converge and use fewer firms pay less. Those are the facts. So the debate's over. But the other point is actually a bit more interesting and subtle about my friend Brian here is that those of you who are dialing in today who don't have legal operations staff, don't be afraid of this because that process was by and large led by that guy, who last time I looked was a lawyer. So he was, as you were saying, Greg, the, the sort of lawyer that everyone's looking for now, Does practices the law, but can also run a data-driven process to objective goals. So at the one stage, Avis Budget got eventually an operations person, but the most part of that process was done by a lawyer. So I say this to everybody, it is an essential to have operations leader to drive performance improvement. It's a skill set that all lawyers are now required to, to broaden into, which is why Brian is now top dog in his own um, legal department. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, Brian, for taking us on that journey. Um, I don't see the resemblance between you and George Jetson, but um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. I love that analogy. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Again, one of the headlines in the report, and I just think this is an interesting slide to take a quick look at, that you know, the, the rise of alternative legal service providers, LPOs, uh, different ways to get work done. Uh, I don't think this trend is going away. Um, nonetheless, uh, this gives you a little breakdown uh, of kind of how big and small organizations and by industry um, ALSPs are, are viewed. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, another interesting data point, um, just 12% of organizations have uh, increased their usage of ALSPs in, in uh, 2020. Um, and also on this slide, uh, you see a breakdown of outside counsel fees used. And I just want to maybe bring Sam in here for some commentary, um, both on ALSPs or just generally uh, I know there's been so much written and said about the death of the hourly rate, but uh, it seems like it's alive and well uh, based on this slide. Sam, thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Uh, let me make two quick points because we have to go into Q&A. The first one is ALSPs. Typically, I'll give you our example is that we have a very small number and ALSPs are starting to you know, have a broad impact because they actually just don't do one thing anymore. They, they're not just e-discovery vendors. They're not just contracting. They're not just, uh, sorry, they're not just doing one or the other. They actually are helping an organization across the board. And as a result, you're going to see less, less ALSPs and the big four getting into it. We're going to use very specific uh, um, partners as a result. And so the numbers may be uh, misleading. The spend is more important. Uh, I think we'll see a growth there. Um, the discounted hourly rate model is the most common that I've seen. I've worked in multiple companies now, and I, I, I don't see that changing dramatically. Uh, I know there are you know, uh, organizations like GSK who use um, flat fee arrangements in a big way. Um, we do use them, but we are selective about how we use them. And we have, I think, a plethora of use across the board here. But if you look at the largest uh, spend, I would I would look at discounted hourly rates as the most common uh, in in our world. Thanks, Sam. All right, we're we're at the Q and A portion. Um, we made it just to the finish line, um, and there's been a ton of Q and A um, lighting up my screen here. Uh, so thank you everyone for your engagement um, throughout. Uh, Let's take this one and I'll put it out to the group. Um, well, maybe this one actually is for Brian. Um, given your experience helping to lead a legal transformation project, is there ever a right time to do it? Is there ever a sweet spot? Well, I, I think, I think it, it, you're asking the question now, so now's the right time. Um, I, I don't think there's, you know, if, if you're waiting for that magic moment, you're going to find that your moment probably passed you, you know, minutes ago. 
if not hours and days ago. No, there's, I think as soon as you're ready to go, you got to have the right mindset though. And I think you got to have the right support. Uh, so you do have to have the groundwork that's laid out to help support um, whatever findings and direction you're trying to go. But I think now is is the time. There's there's never a better time than the present. Yeah, thank you, Brian. All right, let's get another question in here. Um, regarding ALSPs, this one's for Trevor. What's the method for deciding how and when to use an alternative legal service provider? It, it, it's very very closely allied to say the question around alternative fees. Not all we know as lawyers and as practitioners, not all, not all work is the same. There's at least two axes that you can divide your work into to decide which is more amenable to ALSPs and to flat fees. Um, the relative legal and financial exposure, high to low, and the rel relative volume and frequency. So at the high end, which we call the cream, high exposure, high legal consequence, low volume. At the low end, like contract management, for commodity contracts, what we call commodity and, uh, and core, high volume, relatively low legal and financial exposure per item. Now, once you, if you can break your work down into th those three tiers, cream, core, commodity, you can then see very clearly what sort of work is amenable to ALSPs, core and commodity, and what's more amenable to fixed fees or alternative fees. Us lawyers tend to conflate things by saying, because work is high end and elaborate and unusual, it can't be, et cetera. But in reality, a process of disaggregation allows you to separate and have both. Excellent. Thank you, Trevor. All right, we are right at time. And again, I want to thank everyone for the questions. Please feel free to contact us directly through the ACC or MLA or Smarter Law with any specific questions. This is a, this is a topic you can't really uh, land in one hour. Um, and, and I think as you dive into the report and into your data and, and, and begin to look at your own situation, um, you get a better sense of your of your health as an organization. I think of benchmarking as an annual physical, so if you hadn't had a checkup in a while, uh, let's, it might be time to get one. I wanna thank Sam, Brian, and Trevor. I wanna thank the ACC. I know we had a, a Blake Garcia hanging in the background who's the head of research for the ACC. He is a wizard and we're so appreciative of his partnership. Um, and we did not need to tap him today for questions. But if, again, if you do have questions about the report itself, ACC at research or research at acc.com. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Sam.